Hello and welcome to part 13, which is the final part of our course of lectures on deductive logic. And this is uh, this lecture today is meant to summarize um, the entire course. Let's talk first about logic and philosophy. The premise of this course is that the study of logic is a core part of the academic discipline known as philosophy. But nonetheless, that philosophy itself is the outcome of a broader movement in Western civilization known as comprehensively critical rationalism, something we are. And it became useful to distinguish uh, two senses of philosophy, not only the modern academic discipline, which I typically call um, but also the older attempt, uh, CTR, in other words, from Thales onward, the very beginnings of the Socratic uh, beginnings of philosophy, uh, to subject received wisdom to critical scrutiny, which I tend to call P1. And I don't develop this concept in this class, I do develop it in the introductory class. So once again, if that's of any interest to you, that's because you know, introductory course lectures like these lectures are also recorded and, uh, and posted on YouTube. Of all the topics in philosophy, logic may be the most central to what the whole enterprise of philosophy has been trying to do from the beginning. It should not be surprising then that logic is a core competency in training philosophy students. As much as anything, it is what makes philo majors so stunningly employable in a variety of applications. Yes, you did hear that right. What makes philo majors uh, so stunningly employable in a variety of occupations? Uh, we're going to return to this point at the end of the lecture. It's somewhat counterintuitive, but um, I, I hope you will be as pleasantly surprised as I was when I first discovered it. The point is that. Logic is not merely the technical study of forms such as the syllogism or the Venn diagrams. Logic is also a key component of CCR. And so from the beginning of the first lecture, we looked at three philosophical problems, uh, rationalism versus empiricism. That is the question, what's the source of our knowledge? Does it come from reason or from experience or as Kant suggested from a strategic combination of both? Secondly, the notion of analytic versus synthetic propositions. Of any proposition, can we or can we not deny it without self-contradiction? Turns out that there are some we can and some we cannot. And finally, the notion of the goal of our knowledge, what's it, what's it all for, certainty or error reduction? Can we, need we attain certainty about what we claim to know or can we simply rest content with making fewer mistakes? And the pertinence of these three problems to logic, it seems to me is as follows. Empiricism, and especially in the form of Kant's, what I call empiricism 2.0, won out. Uh, this, this debate, insofar as it's been a winner. In the short term, it seemed a, vic a victory for inductivism over deduction, but in the wake of Popper and the history of philosophy of science, deduction is back, and it is in some important ways. With respect to the analytic synthetic question, logic is the study of argument, but we need argument only to the extent that we deal with synthetic rather than analytic claims. Detecting fallacy also becomes important only in proportion to the fact that most claims are things about which we could be. And third, with respect to the goal of knowledge, certainty, or error reduction, if certainty is elusive and the best we can hope for is a modicum of error reduction, then we must be more modest about what we can expect from logic. That having been said, we move then into the basic concepts of logic. Logic is the study of argument. That's the basic definition. Argument in turn is defined, and it's defined linguistically, mind you, as a group of statements, any sentence having truth value, but one with a particular internal structure, at least one of those statements, premises, or premise or premises, supports one of the others that we can call conclusion. And we had a, a brief look, um, <laughs> notwithstanding that YouTube puts a little, a little stumbling block in our way there, but at Monty Python's argument critic uh, to, to expound the notion that that, um, that argument is primarily a linguistic thing, not necessarily a psychological or anthropological. Um, the question of who was arguing, how he did the argument might be, et cetera, these are strictly irrelevant. It would be possible to analyze an argument purely in terms of language. First of all, are the premises true? And secondly, do they support, in fact, the purported conclusion? Hmm? For deductive logic, the first issue involves substantively truth value, and the second issue involves formally validity. Therefore, at least two consequences follow. First of all, to comment on an assertion that it's just your opinion is, strictly speaking, irrelevant in logic. 
You need to call attention to any personal anthropological or psychological feature of an argument is bound to commit one or another fallacy. We looked at things like the ad hominem to quoque, et cetera, et cetera. We distinguish between logical order and speech order. Hmm? It's important to do this with respect to logical order. It's syllogism, which is, of course is the basic form of the deductive argument, stress on the operative word there being form. Um, but we don't speak in syllogisms. Uh, that's logical order, that's fine, but speech order is something different. Uh, of course, the logical order has a, it's a distinct form, two premises, major premise first, minor second, and the conclusion, and we typically write it in this manner, three statements with a little uh, therefore sign. Conclusion number three. We say of the study of deductive logic that it is formal, Inasmuch as much as it's important to, as it is important first to ignore the substantive content of the syllogism in order to concentrate on its formal structure. And I use the metaphor of Naomi Campbell, a uh, nice attractive body and Naomi's skeleton, not so nice to look at, but very important uh, structural foundational. When you're asked, and you will be asked, to name the form of an argument, forget Naomi. Pretty, yes, she is, but abstraction. Concentrate on the skeleton, concentrate on the form. Syllogism aims at soundness, which is defined as the property of an argument which meets two, both of two coordinate conditions. Form of the argument is valid, that's the formal requirement, and the relevant premises are all true, that's the substantive requirement. And you need both. And when you have both, then you have the property of soundness. If you lack either or both, uh, you lack that property uh, or your syllogism. Again, they are coordinate, they're not identical, and a sound argument has to include both. Validity, I mentioned that a little while ago. Uh, it is the single most important and the single most difficult concept in deductive logic. It is a term of art. We use the term validity in a very specific way. So when you hear somebody saying, you know, oh, you have a valid point, they're not really using it strictly correctly because of you know, the substance of a, of a claim. But validity basically is that property of a deductive argument such that if and only if, first of all, the form is valid, and secondly, all relevant premises are true, then what happens is the conclusion can never be false. That's a conditional, that's a, that's a strong conditional, if and only if. But if and only if these two coordinate uh, conditions are met, then the conclusion can never be false and it must of logical necessity be true. Now, that's the definition of validity. Our very definition of validity though also yields a test for it. A valid argument is one in which, so long as the premises are true, the conclusion can never be false. And again, that's a conditional. So therefore, if you could take any syllogism, give it true premises and produce a false conclusion, what do you know? Well, you know something important. You know that it is an invalid inference. It's an invalid syllogism. And of course, if you try to do that same test and your syllogism fails to fail the test, basically, we call it valid. There's is always a provisional judgment though. That means not yet invalid, but you know, um, We've been doing this kind of test for 2,500 years. And so if, for example, the Barber syllogism has failed to fail the test for 2,500 years, well, that's not certainty, but it's pretty damn close. The situation is well illustrated uh, on table 1.1, which I said to you was the, the single most important page in that entire bloody expensive text. Um, there you can see out of eight possible permutations, true, false premises and valid or invalid form, no valid form can make true premises produce false conclusions. So that permutation is empty. There are no examples you can give, but you can give examples for the remaining seven. And notice there also valid forms. Yes, they can produce false conclusions and invalid forms. Yes, they can produce true conclusions. That's why we need to examine both validity and true. To apply the test for validity, we began with the conditional syllogism because there's only four permutations there. And it's convenient because two are valid and two are invalid. And we showed that for two of the modus ponens and modus tollens, you cannot plug true premises in and produce a false conclusion. They're valid. Whereas for asserting the consequent and denying the antecedent, yes, it is possible to plug in true premises, still get a false conclusion, which is why they're invalid, which is why we also call them fallacies. These are, of course, formal fallacies. You can have all the form. Later on, we talked about, of course, informal fallacies where it's simple a matter of eyeballing. But yes, the fallacy of asserting the consequent 
and the fallacy of denying the antecedent. By the way, the fallacy of asserting the consequent, I said at one point, is probably the single most commonly committed deductive fallacy. And we saw that, of course, we saw, we'll come to in a moment, Popper's critique of what's called inductive reasoning. The universal test of validity, that's what we just did, uh, is known as substitution instances. You substitute um, some statements that you know to be true in the premises and see if you can produce a false conclusion or not. And I, you know, Mr. Hurley says, and I, I would second this, dogs and cats examples are really good here because some dogs, cats, mammals, uh, there's all kinds of stuff. Well, I, my favorite one, of course, is the dog, uh, dog and raining uh, example. Um, if, if even one time you can make the syllogism in question produce a false conclusion from true premises, then you have shown that that syllogism is invalid and you have done so definitively. Once invalid, always invalid, like thievery. Once a thief, always a thief. In order to make the test work, of course, you have to stipulate that the major premise is true. So if I say, if I give the condition, if it's raining and my dog is wet, I'm going to stipulate that there's no way the dog can hide, there's no porch, there's no shed, there's no dog house, et cetera, et cetera. And so that, that is true uh, by stipulation. And if it's true, and if it's true that it's raining, you know, um, my dog uh, uh, must be wet. Um, dog cannot be dry. Um, could the dog ever not be wet under those conditions? No. So we've shown that one is not yet invalid. That is to say, we're going to take it provisionally. We're going to, we're going to take it for valid. Um, and of course, this is this is the modus ponens syllogism. Um, the test for that. Counterintuitively, do not ask first about the truth value of the content. Ask first about validity, and truth value does not settle validity. So if you look at these three arguments. Well, the first one, the conclusion is true, and the second two, the conclusions are false. So should we therefore predict the top one is valid and the bottom two invalid based on truth value of the conclusions? No, we shouldn't, because if we did, we'd make a key mistake. It turns out that the first and the third have invalid forms, and we can show that by substitution. For instance, I uh, that. We can also show, though, that the middle one, the second one, is a valid argument form, even though the conclusion is false. Again, by substitution instance, the man example that's been used in time. Now, interesting, interesting thing happened to logic in the history of philosophy. Aristotle began with deduction, Bacon criticized it. Bacon's criticism displaced deduction, making induction tantamount to philosophy of science several centuries, but in the 20th century, induction, oh, actually before, uh, induction in turn was subjected to criticism, first by Hume's problem of induction in the 18th century, second by Popper's critique of inductivism as the basis for philosophy of science in the 20th. And in a tour de force, Popper demolished induction. Here's how it works. You can take what reports to be an inductive process and state it as a deductive syllogism, additional syllogism, um, so the, the standard example, you know, um, all swans are white, you count swan one, you count swan two, you count swan three, enumerate all the swans up to swan n, has to be a rather large number, and you conclude all swans are white. But what you're actually doing logically, this popper, is using a deductive syllogism, using deductive reasoning in the form of syllogism, those conditional first of all, major premise, if all swans are white, then each swan is white, okay? Then you go out and you find that this swan is white, and that's the first swan, and then you find the second swan is white, and you find the third swan is white, all the way up to n, whatever number n is, is white, and then you conclude all swans are white. So basically what you're doing is you're saying, if A, then B, and the minor premise is asserting B, and then the conclusion is asserting A. Hmm? We've seen this bad boy before, we have. This is the fallacy of affirming the consequent. And if one, one wrong doesn't make a right, do n wrongs make a right? No, it's just, um, it just makes it worse. So what purports to be induction or mixed by enumeration is a non-deductive form and a bad deductive form. It's affirming the consequent. It is a basic fallacy. Um, yes, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty, pretty devastating. Testing a scientific theory is an exercise, also in deductive reasoning, says Popper, 
but it, it uses modus ponens, and so one of the valid forms. If theory A is true, it yields a conditional consequent B as an hypothesis, but you show that B is false, and therefore you show that falsity redounds upon A. The falsity of the hypothesis derived conditionally from the theory redounds upon the falsity of the theory antecedent. Therefore, this is a this is kind of a remarkable conclusion, particularly in light. Uh, I, should, I should point this out, particularly in light of the view, which is generally true, that in contrast to science, philosophy has made a lot of progress. Uh, that's generally true. But here is a really critical example of progress and change, uh, in well, at least in my own. Um, induction really isn't a separate form of logic at all. Hmm? It is really deduction, and it is a known invalid form of that deduction. Also, affirming the consequent. But Popper says there's a silver lining to this cloud. Fortunately, science doesn't rely on induction in the first place. Instead, it tests its theoretical generalizations through modus ponens, another deductive form. Making theory A produce conditional consequent B is refuting A by refuting B. Okay, that brings us to the topic of language. Now, Aristotle hit on a good idea. Man is the two things, the political animal and the speaking animal. So on political and dialogo lejo. And modern scholarship agrees with Aristotle on this. Language use is one of the distinctive features of the human species. However, on the topic of language, philosophy dropped the ball for about two millennia. Um, you know, Aristotle picked it up. Uh, Chomsky agrees today, but in the middle, not a lot was said. The topic of language was first revived with the growth of logic. Uh, this took place from the 19th century with folks like Boole and Carroll and Venn, Venn of the Venn diagrams, through Moore, Russell, Whitehead, Wittgenstein, uh, Ayer, and so forth in the 20th century. So language came back into philosophy in a big way. One of the key problems of modern logic became how to get around the great ambiguities in natural languages so as to achieve clarity of speech and thus also clarity of thought. Ambiguity, again, is not just fuzziness, not just uh, you know haziness. It is any verbal nuance, however slight, which gives room for alternative readings to the same piece of language. Now, if clarity depends on language having unequivocally one and only one meaning, then ambiguity threatens clarity. Logic must act in some way against ambiguity. And symbolic logic was one part of this. Symbolism was intended, intended to eliminate ambiguity by means of introducing a non-natural language, which was non-ambiguous, like the natural languages. <clears throat> Another part was the logical positivist movement. And we did spend some time examining that. Positivism ended banish metaphysics and ethics regarded as inevitably fully minded in favor of clear, neutral observation language. As we've also seen, that attempt failed, crashed and burned. Positivism has left some echo effects. One of them is a suggestion in logic textbooks that ambiguity is intrinsically bad across the board, that emotion is to be avoided at all costs as an inevitable source of unclarity, uh, what Julia Galef called the Vulcan fallacy. Nowadays, we tend to say, lighten up. Ambiguity isn't all bad always. Hmm? Um, language has uses other than logic and philosophy. In literature and poetry and song and jokes and puns. And, Life would be less interesting if we just banished all ambiguity. Likewise, emotion is not bad in its own right. However, whenever we wish to speak clearly, and we do so in expositional writing, we do so in precise speaking, then it does remain important to eliminate ambiguity and to prune, I should say prune, uh, emotive meanings in favor of clearer cognitive meaning. Term is, again, definition, any word or arrangement of words that may serve as the subject of a statement. Obviously, if it is already the subject, it can so serve, but a predicate could also serve that way in another context. Terms have meaning insofar as they refer, that is, they point to something beyond themselves. Reference. Terms can have either or both intentional or extensional meaning, sense of reference, and the latter is defined in terms of sets or categories. Uh, which we represent um, with, with uh, set theory does with circles. That's why we draw circles, for example, and diagrams, we're using sets. Then we turn to the topic, after having done this, this kind of formal systematic stuff, we, we turn to the topic of informal fallacies. And the definition of a fallacy generally is any defect in an argument that consists of something other than merely 
false premises. And once again, we're contrasting substantive truth value with something else. In the case of formal fallacies, affirming the consequent, for example, that something else was a bad form, an argument is unsound if it contains true premises so long as it fails to use valid form. In the case of informal fallacies, though, there's no form. Nonetheless, informal fallacies exhibit defects that are not due strictly to issues of truth or falsity. The bad news is informal fallacies are harder than formal fallacies. They cannot be learned systematically. There is no handy test for validity like the substitution of for example. The good news is there are rules of thumb and Mr. Hurley's text is particularly good on these. First of all, as with the formal fallacies, if an argument type like the straw man or the appeal to unqualified authority, et cetera, if it proves unreliable in one instance, then it's unreliable in other instances. Secondly, there are groups of fallacies sharing common characteristics, and Mr. Hurley does, does group these together, I think, rather well. Thirdly, any argu argumentative move which says, in effect, shut up and stop reasoning, this is going to be fallacious. The ad hominem is particularly at fault here, but it's not alone. And last, informal fallacies always have their limits. Whether any argumentative move is actually fallacious or not depends on whether or not it impedes good reasoning. Sometimes it is not fallacious to rephrase. Sometimes it is. Um, if you are if you are caricaturing or or erecting a straw man, that kind of rephrasing is a problem. But rephrasing per se is not. Some authorities are genuinely appropriate for some. Purpose. Yeah, I think I would take my doctor's advice more seriously than I would any Tom Dick and Harry's. Uh, even though my doctor may be fallible, may have certain self-interests. I told you the story of my doctor who was a teetotaler and advised me that my antibiotics would not work if I drank alcoholic beverages. Okay, but apart from that, you know, on the whole, I'm going to go to a medical doctor and not to a witch doctor. Um, so is that fallacious to do? No, it's not, not at all. But if I say, you know, the Pope says it and he's a smart boy, that settles everything. You know, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's another kind of appeal to authority, qualified authority. So it makes a difference. And you have to think about these things. You can't just apply, slap on, you know, in kind of a logical fundamentalist way. Policy labels would be done with. Getting a grip on the informal fallacies requires a lot more effort on the part of students than it does the, the formal ones. Um, those are systematic. There, um, I, as a teacher, can help you out, and I try to do that, show you some shortcuts, but What's the others? It's not a matter of system. It's not it informal. It's not a matter of system. It's a matter of law. And you've got to get these things under your belt. Um, but of all the things a student might take from a logic course, a grip on fallacies might be the most practical, most long lasting. So I think it's worthwhile to make the extra effort. Um, you know, once you become familiar with these, you'll, you'll see them. You'll think of, you know, I've seen this kind of thing before. This is, you know, this is book me, uh, and I'm not going to buy this. It's a, it's a big help getting through life. Then we turn back to some systematic topics once more. Uh, the categoricals, first of all, the categorical propositions, which in turn leads to the logisms. Remember chapter two on terms? The extension of a term, what is it? It's all the members of a term, uh, of a set, sorry, denoted by that term. So if I say, for example, the term is cats, then the denotation, the extension, uh, the reference is all the empirically existing cats. Categoricals are about categories or classes, sets, call them what you will. And these sorts of things are, are uh, what we use when we do the circles in the Venn diagrams. We're talking about members in a group, members in a set. And those, of course, are things inside. Um, we distinguish um, between subject predicate and predicate, uh, subject predicate and subject and predicate terms by way of trying to, uh, to, to learn to construct standard forms for categorical propositions, and standardization just makes things more regular and simple. So here's a proposition. It's a sentence, of course, but a proposition is a sentence that has truth value. Uh, this one happens to um, Any sentence that has a subject and a predicate, so the subject is all cats, so the predicate is our mammals. The subject has a subject, subject term, cats, and it also has a quantifier, That's not English, logic. The predicate has a copula. This is a linking verb. In this case, it is the verb to be and the third person plural. Because we're dealing with sets, it's plural. Sets can have multiple members. And the predicate term is mammals. 
So a standard form categorical proposition will have all four bits and in this order. We talked about quantifiers. Uh, quantity and quality are important properties of categorical propositions. Quantity is the property of being either universal or particular. Quality is the property of being either affirmative or negative. And here again, we use one of our Punnett squares to illustrate this quality in the columns and quantity in the rows in two by two gives us, guess what, four. And we give these, um, these four different permutations, vowel names for simplicity's sake. The universal affirmative says all SRP, we call it A. The others we call respectively. Distribution, another term of art. It's this time a property of individual terms. That is to say the S term or the P term, subject term or the predicate term um, within a proposition. And we say that a term, whether it's S or P, is distributed if and only if the proposition makes a claim about the whole set of which the term is a member. And here it's just a summary of that using not, we're not quite to the point of using Venn diagrams yet. These are the simpler Euler diagrams, but you can see how two of these do say something about uh, uh, every S and two of these things uh, do not. Uh, so is S distributed for all of the nodes only distributed? Here's a table summarizing the four standard categorical propositions, given their vowel symbols, given their quantities and qualities and quantities, and given the terms that they distribute. Sorry. Um, then we moved on to the basics of the Venn diagram. Okay, uh, two circles overlapping, uh, we're labeled as S and P for the subject and predicate term in the single proposition. And now we're still this point, we're just dealing with single categorical propositions. We haven't yet gone on. To the syllogism. There's a Venn diagram for that. It's, it builds upon this. It's slightly different, but it's basically the same thing. And I put training wheels on. Uh, Mr. Hurley doesn't do this, but this found to be useful in, in, in years. And I use the Roman numerals here, one, two, and three. And there's, a, of course, implicitly the property space for anything which is outside uh, one, two, and three. We don't normally use that, although we'll see when we come to the, and we have seen, when we come to the transforms, that becomes really useful. But one, two, and three, basically. And we're going to mark uh, our diagrams uh, to indicate what the proposition in question says by marking either property space one or property space two. And this is basically how we do this. We shade for the universals and we X for the particulars. And you know, this I'm not going to go through the whole thing here, but you've seen this before. The, how the four different types of categorical propositions in standard form will turn out in Venn diagrams. We also looked at the square of opposition. This is a traditional square of opposition. There's also the modern square, but so you don't have to worry about that. Boolean, Boolean sort of distinction here. For our purposes, it's enough. If you understand how this square works, you understand the point. And there are a number of different relationships which will hold. Um, or among the well, the different four different types of categorical propositions, and here they are summarized: the contradictory, the contrary, the subcontrary, and subalternation. And then we looked at the transforms. That is, what happens if you take a standard form and you transform it in various ways according to various change rules: the converse, the obverse, and the positive. And you see that in some cases, but not all cases. The standard form becomes what we call logically equivalent to its transform. That is to say, if the, if the two are logically equivalent, they have the same truth value. So if the standard form is true, the transform is false. Or sorry, it's, just, it's also the same truth value. Uh, and, um, and if it's false, then the same, the transform is false. But for some of them, it doesn't work that way. We don't know just because we know the truth value of one, the truth value of the other. The truth value is indeterminate. Okay. Then we move on to categorical syllogisms. And a categorical syllogism is a deductive argument consisting of three categorical propositions. Previously, we just looked at single categorical propositions that is capable of being translated into standard form. And here's an example. This is the famous Barber example. All A are B, all C are A, therefore all C are B. All three of these are categorical propositions and they're in standard form. Put them together in a syllogism, you have guess what? a categorical syllogism. Um, it too has a standard form. 
there are four bits uh, to each of the propositions as they're typical. Uh, each of them has a quantifier and all of them have a copula, which is the same in all cases. The major term and the minor term refer to terms in the premises. And then they also refer to of those terms in the major and minor premises, respectively. There is, uh, there are the properties then of figure and mood, and these also are terms of art. Um, mood represents the vowel designations of the three propositions in question. So if we have, once again, the barber proposition as we do on the left, all three A propositions. So we say the mood is AAA, triple A. Um, the figure represents where the middle term goes. And the middle term is, of course, the one term that goes in each of the premises, but never in the conclusion. But it can go in a number of different places. And there are four possible, possible permutations of that. We call figures one, three, and four. And you can see they've illustrated here the, the famous shirt collar model, if you remember that mnemonic, or the, or the ballet model, if you like that one better. Now, we use Venn diagrams with the categorical syllogisms. We used Venn diagrams previously with the categorical proposition, lone single proposition. There's a big difference, and that is this. The Venn for the proposition, the simple Venn, is a hieroglyph. That is, it's just another way of stating in, in pictures what the syllogisms or what the, what the propositions are as in words. And it needs to be an accurate representation, but it needs to, it needs to draw a picture basically for what the words say. Whereas, the Venn for the compound Venn for the syllogism is going to turn out to be a machine that is just going to do some work. Uh, it's going to crank out a conclusion, it's going to use it as a test, and you're going to say, okay, of this syllogism in question, remember there are 256 ones, of this particular one we're dealing with right now, is it valid or is it invalid? And the Venn diagram provides a very simple eyeball kind of test to do that with all that complexity of two. And so we worked on doing that for a while. And you know, you diagram basically one premise, then you diagram the other premise. Um, and then jump back, Jack. You don't diagram the conclusion in that three circle diagram, but it's useful to diagram that conclusion separately. And then you compare. And the question you want to ask yourself is: does the does the Venn diagram for the syllogism as a whole say at least as much as the Venn diagram for the conclusion says that it has to? You're going to get an answer either yay or nay. It's going to be a clear, unambiguous answer. And if the answer is yay, it says at least as much, then you know you have a valid inference. And if it says nay, then you have an invalid inference. And it's just simple. And that's, again, how our machine works. It cranks out a conclusion. It is a test for validity, just like previously the substitution instances test for validity. So, so far, we've considered two different tests for validity. The substitution instances is universal. That is, it works with the categorical syllogism, but it also works with the conditionals. But the Venn diagram test works only for the categoricals and do the conditional. There's a third test, it's called rules. And this again, only to categoricals, it's not universal, but if a categorical violates even one of these five rules, it's invalid, here they are, I'm not gonna go over them all, all again. Um, okay, then the last issue, what's the use of logic? Academic life is often characterized by the metaphor of the ivory tower. Um, a bunch of you know intellectuals up in the clouds don't really have uh, much to do with the actual practical workings of the world. Uh, spend their lives and study, you know, in cloistered in the ivory tower. And everybody else has to live in the world and and sort the problems out. We just write about the world. You guys have to save the bloody thing, right? It's the humanities and the classics contrasted with what we now call STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, uh, which is singled out as impractical. Of course, uh, philosophy and part of the humanities classics for that matter. Um, yeah, you got to get a liberal education or you got to get a job. Well, if you want a job, you better not get a liberal education. You better stick with the, at least that's the mantra that's a lot of people. I mean, it's not just recent, it's been going on. Some time, but the problem with that is, as Mark Twain says, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And this is one of those things. Um, this blew me away when I first discovered it, but it's true. Philosophers have some of the highest scores on admissions tests for management school, 
philosophers have the, have the highest scores on admissions tests for law school. Philosophers have the highest acceptance rates at medical school. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I was on uh, uh, my last trip before the pandemic. I was in Paris uh, and having dinner next to a couple. He was uh, he's on the faculty of Harvard Law School and on the admissions committee. And their daughter was going up to Cambridge. Uh, the was Michaelmas going up, and uh, they were a little bit worried about her getting into the humanities field, you know, because dad was you know, in the sciences and, and you know, going for a classics degree or whatever she was going for. It's not not going to be practical. And I I, I told him this. Uh, and he said, you know, when you think about that, that's the, the, there's something there. I sit on the admissions committee at Harvard, and we get a lot of guys who have gone through pre-med, but they can't think their way out of a paper bag. And I've seen some really crappy candidates who've done, you know, ticked all the boxes off on, on pre-med, but yet I wouldn't want them in med school. And, you know, people who can people who can reason their way out of a paper bag, they can be brought up to snuff. On the science bit, you know, have to do a little remedial stuff. But yeah, they they're actually really good, often very good candidates for med school. Um, and you know, you can see why. And I'm I'm not just talking about somebody who's taken a philosophy course here and there. I'm talking about somebody who's gone through a philosophy major and they will have taken intensively study in logic, a number of, of courses in logic. Um, they're going to get some skills that transfer to a variety of, of areas. Um, and that's a key reason why philosophy majors do so well. It's not just in medical school, it's in law school, it's in management school, other things as well. Philosophy majors get a particularly intense grounding in logic. Um, so a good basic logic course should stand any student in good stead, even if they don't go all the way and become a philo major, no matter what their eventual career path is. And the best example I can think, um, think of considering how a grounding in logic can have practical payoffs comes from the film Gettysburg, the, the events at Gettysburg, which it depicts. At Gettysburg, the 20th Maine Volunteer Infantry opposed the 15th Alabama Volunteer Infantry up that little round top. And there you see on the right, there is a, a map of the, that particular battlefield and the disposition, the Union troops in blue, the Confederate in red, and the inset there shows the 20th Maine. Uh, Company B, as you can see, is cut off at the right. The rest of the 20th Maine is up there on the heights and is folded around um, in, a, in a kind of an L shape, and it's being attacked uphill by the 15th Alabama. I want to show you a film clip from uh, from the film Gettysburg that shows uh, this incident. Now, but it's what it what it depicts did happen, um, but. It would have been a lot noisier on the battlefield than the film depicts. They, they've got it, you know, they, they wouldn't have been able to do the dialogue if it had only been as noisy as the battlefield was. But, you know, when you hear the phrase, the fog of war, that's what happens. There's a lot of confusion uh, in the era of black powder, a lot of gun smoke. You know, you can't see, you can't hear thundering noises. But, you know, give, them, give, the, give the, the filmmaker his uh, creative license here and see, see what they did. Colonel uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and his command. Uh, on top. Sir, half my men are down. Most of the rest are wounded. The left is too thin, sir. How are we fixed your ammunition? It's almost gone. Sir, we're running out. We don't have much left to shoot with. Some of the boys got nothing at all. Sir, sir, what do we do for ammunition? Sir, my boys have to take up red muskets and they're back with them. Sir, we ought to pull out. No, we can't do that. We can't hold them again, sir. You know that. Well, if we don't, they go on by and over the hill and the whole flank caves in. Sir. Here they come. Well, we can't run away. If we stay here, we can't shoot. So let's fix bayonets. We'll have the advantage of moving down the hill. They gotta be tired, the revs. They gotta be close to the end if we are. So fix bayonets. Ellis, wait, Ellis, you take the left wing, I'll take the right. I want a right wheel forward of the whole regiment. What do you mean, charge? Yes, but here's what we do. We're going to charge swinging down the hill. Just like we pulled back to this left side of the regiment, now we're going to swing it down. We swing like a door. We're going to sweep them down the hill just as they come up. Understand? Does everybody understand? Yes, yes sir. sir. OK, Ellis, you take the left wing. And when I give the command, I want the whole regiment to go forward swinging down to the right. All right, sir. Fine. Move. Hey, I'm down!
Right, right wheel. Right wheel! Charge. Charge! The officer, played by Jeff Daniels, and the script was Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. He commanded the 20th Maine Volunteer Infantry Regiment. And what what the film depicts is pretty much what happened. Um, how's our ammunition? Almost gone, sir. We're running out. We don't have much to shoot. The boys are picking up the red muskets. We got to pull out. No, we can't do that. And hold them again, sir. If they don't, if we don't, sorry, they go right over the hill and the flank caves in. This is officer was Captain Ellis Spear. There he is. He survived. They both did survive. Uh, they were friends lifelong. There he is a little bit later in life. Colonel Chamberlain first gets his facts together. We have no ammunition. Then weighs the facts against his long-term, long-range goal. If he retreats, then the flank caves in. The entire Union position is in danger. Indeed, there are some historians that say the battle may have been lost. The war may have been lost at that very point. You can't no, for sure, but it's certainly a reasonable prospect. So, situation is pretty dire. Uh, but Chamberlain makes a rational decision given how the facts weigh against the military imperative. Well, we can't run away. If we stay here, we can't shoot. So, let's fix bayonets. It's an audacious decision. Uh, on his side, Captain Spear has the conventional wisdom. If the odds are too great, cut your losses and retreat. Hugo fights and runs away, lives to fight another day. So Chamberlain's uh, decision to fix bayonets is audacious, flies to the fact, perhaps of common sense. But is it either stupid or irrational to do what he did? In defense of Colonel Chamberlain, he's looking at the bigger picture. If the 50th Alabama is allowed to continue its charge, it could fold back the entire Union position. Even if the bayonet charge seems crazy, the alternative, also crazy, it's arguably a rational decision to choose the lesser of two evils, roll the dice, and hope for a win. As it turns out, Colonel Chamberlain's gamble worked. Uh, in this case, the improbable succeeded. The 20th Maine did charge the bayonet, sweep down the hill, like the closing door that he mentions, did route the 15th Alabama, took many of them prisoner, uh, did save the position. Well, again, historians will differ about how important this maneuver was to the success of the Battle of Gettysburg and the outcome of the Civil War. Uh, Ken Burns, who's a documentarian of the Civil War, is among those who think that Chamberlain's decision may very well have saved the Union, may very well have kept the Confederates from prevailing, or at least adding to a, adding the war to a draw. Um, here's the point. Was Colonel Chamberlain a professional soldier? Did he graduate from West Point? No, he didn't. The 20th Maine was a volunteer infantry regiment. It was composed of farmers, and in this case, uh, <laughs> Chamberlain, who was a professor. Hmm? Uh, he taught at a small liberal arts college in which he had been a student, Bodoon College. He was professor of rhetoric, later modern languages there. Taught all the subjects except for STEM, certainly with philosophy and logic. That is to say, he was adept in the kind of classical liberal arts regimen that was the core of higher education in his day, including logic, is sort of now disdained uh, when STEM has its tendency. Here's the thing, Professor Chamberlain and Colonel Chamberlain were one and the same man. This is the same guy in both photos. Clearly, he could reason on his feet, he could marshal facts, he could size up a situation, he could draw logical conclusions and set out in quick order a plan of action. And that is exactly what the study of logic should equip all of us to do. 
help knock in such dire circumstances. Notice how Colonel Chamberlain puts this background to work. You know, we ought to pull out and we can't do that. We can't hold them against her. If we don't, they go over the hill and the flat caves in. We can't run away. If we stay here, we can't shoot. So let's fix bayonets. See, logic doesn't give him any magic. He's not pulling out a magical syllogism. Um, he's not pulling out the conventional wisdom. Captain Spear already has those. Uh, this is a, something that's going to solve all of his problems, but it is a resource that he can use to get himself out of a tight fix. Rises up a tough problem, he defines what it is, he weighs his options, he chooses one. Now again, doing this doesn't guarantee success. He's got bayonets to get 50 caliber mini wall ammunition. That's really formidable, put a big hole in you. Uh, the Confederates might well have prevailed. Um, he's hoping that pre-modern steel blades are going to defeat modern black power. Oh, this is kind of risky. It's a gamble at best, but what Chamberlain does did beat panic and succumbing to the fog of war. He did have some reasons on his side. He was assaulting downhill from a superior position. That's good. Uh, the Confederates must be tired, and indeed they were. He didn't know this, but they hadn't been able to replenish their canteens. He knew his men were tired, and he reasoned that the Confederates must be at least as tired as they were. Turns out more so. He didn't know that, but reason. Um, and even though he had less than total knowledge, it wasn't entirely an irrational you know, flip of the coin. Point is, one can easily imagine other commanders taking the advice of Captain Spear. You know, let's, let's retreat and live to fight another day. It would have been the prudent thing to do. Um, it would, the, the, and such officers would have been praised for their rational qualities of wisdom, restraint, and long-range thinking. Instead, and again, the film dramatizes this well, Colonel Chamberlain stopped to think. This is how to Arendt's phrase. When we, when we think, we have to stop for a moment, stop to think. He weighed his options against the facts of the matter, and then he made an unconventional distinction uh, for which a logical case could be made. Could a battlefield commander without his educational background have done the same sort of thing? That's the question. Professor Chamberlain, thrown into Gettysburg as a colonel commanding an infantry regiment, is a pertinent, pertinent example of why it may be important to have a good grounding in logic as well as a good liberal education. And the other, the other example, military example springs to mind is General Von Nguyen Gap. Gap. Uh, he was a, the leader of the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese forces that defeated the American forces uh, at the end in Vietnam. Um, the guy was a school teacher, <laughs> not a West Pointer, not a professional officer, not somebody with military experience. So, you know, these things aren't, are common, but they do happen. Um, whatever the occupation or other circumstance, life is going to come at you head on. Many things are going to be unpredictable. Uh, there are going to be specific circumstances that are surprising or challenging. Logic and a liberal education can provide you some general resources, and you may well apply these to specific circumstances. Now, logic is never going to fulfill Leibniz's dream of having a super calculator that's going to solve all problems, or if you remember, um, uh, the, uh, the, the supercomputer uh, deep thought, uh, the answer to life, the universe, and everything is number 42. Uh, Leibniz didn't have an idea of a computer, but that's the kind of thing he had in mind. Um, no, logic isn't wizardry. It isn't some kind of magic. You know, Mr. Spock isn't going to just kind of even sweep in and save the day. But logic can give us a certain clarity, um, and clarity is better than it's and it's uh, opposite. Uh, let's just have a look at uh, the clip from Bojack Horseman. It must be so hard to lose a loved one. I, for one, never have. You've never lost a loved one. When my mom got old, she moved to a farm. What? Out in the country, where she could have plenty of room to run free. Why would she want to run around if she's old? You know, I never really questioned the logic. My brother set the whole thing up. I, I haven't been able to visit, but everyone in my family goes to that farm eventually. Oh, dude, your mom's dead. What? No. She's at a farm after a prolonged bout of Parkinson's. A farm where they don't have telephones or the internet, and oh my God, she's dead. My, my mom is dead. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, there, there. Yes. <sighs> Who hasn't had a logic class? Hmm. Yeah, clarity can help us cooperate in not lying to ourselves. My recruiter lied to me. Oh, no. Yeah. Or, you know, oh, they're in a better place. Yes. Um, that's, uh, that's certainly not nothing. Clarity can give us presence of mind, whether it's in a battle theater or an operating theater or a court of law or anywhere else for that matter. So, to sum up, logic may not be everything, but it is something. 
maybe it's enough for starters. That concludes the course in deductive logic. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, this has been Michael Cavanaugh. Good day. <laughs>